You can tell it's getting toward the end of the day, can't you? <laughs> We're still here, but... Uh, you know, I got to thinking, actually, oddly enough, while uh, Professor Fletcher was talking about um, about uh, the apology, it sort of popped into my head, uh, thinking about some of these things that have happened in the past. And uh, one thing that, that no one else uh, has mentioned today, I think, that I think it's, it is important to bring up, because we are talking about um, the future of the treaty relationship and what it really means uh, that the United States made these promises, broke them, and is making at least some progress on, on, um, on, on trying to repair the damage that was done. Uh, and it occurred to me that there, there are several things that, that have happened. And uh, uh, as, as some of you know, when I was at the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, I did make an apology on behalf of the Bureau of Indian Affairs for the historic conduct of the agency. And I was careful to say at that time that I did not speak for the United States. Uh, I had no such authority. It would have been uh, an irrigation to pretend that I represented the United States uh, in that way. And so I, I just said, that I, but I am in charge of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and I can speak on their behalf. And I knew how the employees of the Bureau of Indian Affairs felt about the past um, and, uh, and the conduct of the Bureau. Uh, for during the, that long, dark period. Um, and, and so we, we, uh, uh, I, I did make an apology and sort of detailed some of the wrongs in general terms that had been done. Uh, an apology um, contains several specific elements. Um, probably the most important is the acknowledgement, the actual acknowledgement of the wrong that was done. And the more detailed, the better the apology. The more specific you get about what it was you did and why that was wrong, the better the apology. Uh, the second element is an expression of regret and saying, uh, you know, I'm sorry. And uh, that may seem like small potatoes, but, but it, is, uh, it is a key element of, of apology. The last two are the most important, though. Uh, first, uh, a promise to cease the offensive conduct, to stop behaving in this way that's caused harm to you, whoever you may be that I'm apologizing to. And then finally, some sort of corrective action uh, to try to not just make amends, but to try to repair the damage uh, that has been done by the offensive conduct. And I've had this thought before. Um, you should also know, by the way, that uh, the Congress enacted an apology to the Native Nations a few years ago. How many of you knew that? Okay, some. Most of you didn't, right? There's a reason you didn't. It's because almost nobody noticed, uh, because it was in the middle of a several hundred page defense appropriation authorization bill. But it was there. And it had been considered, and it had gone through committee. And interestingly enough, it was sponsored by Senator Brownback, who is now the governor of Kansas. Uh, very conservative. Um, but he felt very strongly that that was something the United States could do, is apologize for his historical conduct, for its historical conduct. The particulars are not that interesting to tell you the truth because the longer the bill was under consideration, the weaker it got and, and the, the, uh, uh, the specificity of the offensive conduct virtually disappeared. But I thought it was significant for this reason, that the United States was beginning to adopt the native narrative about this history between the Indian nations and the United States. And the United States was beginning to say, you know, what you've been saying for all this time, it's true. Those things did happen. And, uh, and I got to thinking about that in this context, that um, we've had some, some comments from folks who heard that we were working on a treaties exhibition, even a few that have actually seen uh, all or, or some of the exhibition and just going, wow, um, 
You, do you think you're going to get away with this? Do you think you really can say these sorts of things? Um, you're a federally funded museum. Uh, you're right here at the foot of Capitol Hill. Uh, do you really think it's, that, that this is something that the museum is going to be able to do? Nobody said you shouldn't do it. But everyone's going, man, you know, you may have a tiger by the tail now. It would be a lie to say I never even thought about that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I will be posting my resume to uh, <laughs> LinkedIn, uh, just in case. I thought about it, and, and um, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that people want to hear this story, that uh, Americans can handle the truth notwithstanding what Jack Nicholson says. I believe the NMAI Act itself uh, is an apology. If you read the NMAI Act, which Suzanne worked so long and carefully on, there is an acknowledgement of wrongs, not a complete roster. If every Indian lined up for their individual apology, we would be there for a very long time. But there is a, a set of findings where the United States is acknowledging, yes, we, our agents, our institutions, did these things. The establishment of the museum itself, it seems to me, is an expression of regret, in a sense, an apology, saying, we, we, we offer you this, we offer you this place, this ground in our capital city, and in our greatest uh, financial center, we offer you the space to have and to tell your story. That's an extraordinary opportunity and one that is just absolutely clear to me. And people say, uh, well, are you sure that, that uh, you should really be criticizing the United States? And, uh, and my answer is always, what did they think we were going to do? Given the opportunity to tell the native story, what did they think we were going to do but, but really bring forward this truth? And the great thing about it is, by giving us this opportunity, they're also saying, we are now willing to listen. We're willing to hear it, we want to know about it, and we can handle the truth. And that, that is, as I say, uh, a magnificent opportunity that we must always be very careful with, uh, be very responsible, do our very, very best always to, to tell the truth, um, but not to be afraid either to tell the truth. If, uh, if they're willing to hear it, we cannot, be, we cannot be afraid to say it. And what we're doing in, in this treaties exhibition is the beginning of that. The, the museum had some important work to do before we could get to this point, and it was extraordinarily important. Building these facilities was no small matter, and it took fully 15 years for the facilities of the museum to be opened and, uh, and operating. When this building opened 10 years ago, it saw as its first priority to empower Native people to tell their own story. And, and that it did through its community curation process, through the opening exhibitions where our curators set aside their desires and their expertise and their wishes for what it might look like and allowed Native nations themselves to tell the stories that they wish to tell. We got a lot of criticism for that, but the point was made that Native people can tell their own stories, and it's not the story that you're expecting. So that is done. That's achieved. I and mean, if you look, I was in uh, Kansas City last night at an opening at um, uh, a world-famous art museum, the Nelson Atkins, where they've just opened an exhibition of, of Plains Indian art. And I guarantee you that 15 years ago, this exhibition would look nothing like it does now. And what you see throughout that gallery is the voice of Native people telling the story behind this superior art 
that's been created. And the way the art is presented is as superior art, as extraordinary. That wouldn't have happened 15 years ago, and I believe it's very much because of the work of the NMAI in its early years that that sort of exhibition now has become mainstream and that we will continue to see exhibitions of that type in handling native, native art and native culture. We here at the, at the National Museum of the American Indian now turn our eye to history in a very serious way. We all know that history is being mistaught throughout our formal educational system. I think about all the things I learned about Indians in my formal education, and I have spent the last 40 years unlearning those things because they were wrong. And to be here at the NMAI and have the opportunity not just to learn, but to say to everyone from these magnificent platforms we have in Washington and New York, to say these are the things that are true and to have people believe it because we are, after all, a Smithsonian Museum. And the Smithsonian, as you also know, is never wrong. <laughs> <coughs> sure, it takes us a while to get to the truth from time to time, but eventually we get there. So the NMAI itself is an act of contrition uh, on the part of the United States. And if you, again, if you look carefully, you see there are some very specific provisions, not just vowing to cease offensive conduct, but actual corrective action. And that is most clear in the form of the repatriation provisions of, of the NMAI Act. Um, members of Congress were absolutely mortified to learn uh, about all the Native American human remains that were in museum collections and university collections across the United States, institutions that were being funded by the United States in one form or another. And, uh, and thanks again to Suzanne's careful and diligent work, uh, Congress finally said, enough, that's got to stop. And not only must it stop, you must proactively act to return these, these, uh, these people back to their back to their homes and back to their native nations. We now take it for granted, and everybody says, geez, that was, that was really a terrible thing. It wasn't easy. It wasn't obvious. There are still people out there who say, we shouldn't have to return these things. We stole them fair and square. <laughs> and, uh, and they have great scientific uh, uh, value, and, and we should be allowed to retain them. But those people have lost. And, and they now have no prospect of, uh, of winning that argument. And so, so we do make progress. We do get better. Uh, our country gets better. And, uh, and, and the NMAI itself is an indication of how our country can get better and, and learn to do the right thing and be willing to learn about itself um, and, uh, and then take action uh, to, to correct uh, what's been wrong. It is not an easy process. It is not automatic. There's nothing obvious about what the next phase can be. But certainly if enough of us uh, really believe, as President Cladisby was saying, really believe in, in the promise of the United States, then you have to believe that justice uh, is achievable for Native Americans. And it's not going to happen tomorrow. It may not happen in, in our lifetimes. But uh, the one thing that you will learn in this exhibition is Indians never give up. And they will always insist um, on what they believe to be the just outcome. And I've just not a doubt in the world that uh, perhaps not 25 years from now, Brian, but, um, but some generations from now, they will, we, Indians will be here, right in this place, talking about the sorts of issues we're discussing today and reviewing the progress that's been made uh, since the time, uh, since this day, when we've gathered here to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the opening of this museum. So I want to thank you all for being here today, uh, for your support of the NMAI. Um, this is your museum, and we want you to think of it that way. The stories we tell here 
are your stories. No matter who you are, you will find your story at the NMAI.